He's not a genie in a bottle. He's not your slave. He's your God. Just because you don't get the answer you want right, like, let me turn that around. Just because I don't get the answer that I want right here and right now doesn't diminish his Godship. He will listen. Doesn't mean he is tied to do what I tell him to do. That's a hard truth, guys. remember, but we actually started this year out with a series entitled Future Hope. That was the first series of 2021, where we talked about the promises of God. And then we finished that series, and the very next Sunday, it all got really real for my family, and we lost my dad kind of puts future and hope in a whole new perspective. And then about in June, we went through another series called Promises. So you can see that this has been on my heart this year, this concept of promises, this concept of hope. And the world, how many people have felt, I know some people this morning, have felt the struggle of this year. It's not just me, not my family. It's been a tough year. And you might say, Pastor, what happened? Was it a lie? Were you just talking about hope in the future? No. Actually, this is real hot, guys. Can we turn this down a little bit? Um, I feel like I've learned some things this year about hope and about God's promises. So I thought it would be fitting to finish the year as we move into 2022. Can you believe it? I always say, where's my flying car? (laughs) I have electric cars now. I can't get fly, for Pete's sake. That we talk about hope one last time in in this year. So the big idea for this message is this. When we read God's promises in context, we realize that God's faithfulness transcends our suffering. That we can persevere through suffering by the strength of his presence. By the strength of his presence. That's going to be a key phrase, a key thought, I should say in this entire message today. The strength of his presence. The problem is when we read promises out of context, we believe God has failed us when life proves as challenging as it often does. Has God failed us? Why doesn't God do something? Has God failed us? We have all had a challenging year. I think it's funny how we often act as if turning the calendar to the new year will somehow make a difference in our situation. Oh, it's a new year. Does the calendar know that it's a new year? Does time, like, oh, it's a new year. Okay, COVID's gone. It's gone. It's a new year. Didn't you know? We often kind of, like, we, we, we live in that existence. Oh, new year, fresh start, really? Does the solar system know that it started a new year? I don't know. We have a calendar we measure and we hope. That's okay. The truth is that 2022 may have moments in, in it that are very similar to that of ni- 2019 and 2020 and 2021. There's going to be moments. I'm just telling you right now. There's going to be moments 
There will always be things in our lives that are difficult. Some years more than others, obviously. So let me ask this question. Is God God only when things are going good? Or is God God even in the midst of our struggles? Ask, ask yourself that question today. Is God God when things are going great? Or is God God even in the midst of our struggles? Coffee mugs and rings. Pastor, you having a mental issue? No. Coffee mugs. We all like to put like promises on coffee mugs, don't we? Scriptures, this is my coffee mug. My life verse. I have a life verse on my ring. It's very small. But it is a very particular passage that I love. And we're going to read it together. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And I, listen, we can break it down. Jeremiah 29, 11, at face value, the meaning seems clear, right? The translation is good. This translation is a good translation. Even the original Hebrew, the words communicate God's goodness and his good purposes and hope for his people. To whom? Are the people the prophet is talking to, though? To whom is God speaking other than to me? So we need to contextualize passages like that because we, if we just take that passage and put it on a ring or put it on a mug, and we start standing on that passage, ah, yet we don't understand the fullness of the context of the passage, we get to a crisis in our life and we go, God, what happened? Did you lie to me? I thought, I thought you were for me. I thought you had good things unplanned for me. And we start to get, we would never say it. We would never say it out loud. But mentally we're going, I can't trust God. Because we've taken his word out of context. And I know the context and I still wear this ring. I think the ring becomes the, 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 the coffee mug the life verse becomes all the more potent when you know the context of it. So today we're going to talk a little bit about it. Who is he talking to? When we expand our reading to the verses and chapters surrounding this promise, we discover that the prophet is speaking to the people who've been carried to exile in Babylon. But this is not a good situation in which this verse comes into the world. They have been stripped of their family and homeland. In other words, terrible calamity has already befallen them. We see these words used in the context uh, earlier and after. Their welfare seems entirely overlooked. Maybe you felt that way this past year. God, what's going on? My, I feel like I've been overlooked by you. Do you see... God, do you see what's going on? Don't you have Fox News and CNN? Don't you know what's going on? And God's like, oh, it's so cute. You're so simple. When we consider the verses surrounding our favorite coffee mug or ring passage, we see that not only is God not promising an immediate end of suffering for his people, but he asked them to dig in. Ooh, dig in and accept their current nightmare. Building their future there. Even working to bless those around them who have put them in that situation. Jeremiah 29, not 11, 29, 4 through 7. Here we go. This is what the Lord of the armies 
the God of Israel says to all the exiles I have deported from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourselves and have sons and daughters. Find wives for their sons and give them your daughters to men to marry so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Bad situation. Not good. These people are, let me just let me give you some context to the context. Israel is being judged by God. God has sent them off into exile. They are in what we would consider the only equivalent that I can come up with is like uh, the ghettos during World War II. They're all cloistered into areas of the city. They're not treated well. Okay? It's not like they're like, I mean, some of them were. We got Daniel and Shadrach. Some of them were pulled out of that situation to help serve. But most of them are, are living as third-class I mean, citizens. They're not even citizens. They're slaves. They don't have any rights in where they are. They can live there. So they are, they're in a bad situation. And God says, get comfortable in that bad situation because you're going to be here. In fact, you start working towards your future here. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city. I have deported you too. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. For any of you today who say, I cannot pray for the leaders of my country right now or in the last administration, that promise is for you, right? I mean, that scripture is for you. I don't care who's in, who's out, who's up, who's down. God says, pray, pray, pray in the situation you find yourself in. It's important. Why? For when it thrives, you'll thrive. Thriving in the midst of suffering is the context of my favorite, one of my favorite scriptures. I don't know if I had that perspective one year ago. Unbroken, a World War II story of survival, resilience, and redemption by Laura Hellenbrand tells a story of the Olympic athlete, U.S. Air Force Lieutenant and prisoner of war, Louis Giglio. Uh, not Giglio, <laughs> Zamperini. There's another Louis there, Louis Zamperini. During his uh, service in World War II, Zamperini suffered. Oh, man, this guy suffered. Has anybody read the book? It's a phenomenal book. How many people see the movie? Oh, you're so lazy. Read the book. No, no. I've done both. Oh, man, if you haven't done either, I would encourage you to start with the book because you know I'm a book guy. But if you just can't handle a book, go, re- go watch the movie. It's very good. Don't watch it with your kids. It's one of those movies, man. It'll tear your heart out. He suffered so much. Though enduring so, more, uh, so much suffering, more than, I mean, suffering and discouragement. I mean, this guy was, these concentration camps, these prison camps in World War II uh, that the, uh, the Japanese had set up, they were just, they were death camps. They were awful, work camps. And he just, more than I think even a human being should be able to physically and mentally carry. I don't. I watch this book and I'm thinking, I watch this book. I watch the movie based on the book and I'm thinking, this has got to be some more Hollywood stuff. Because if you don't read the book first and you watch the movie second, you start thinking, there's no way. There's no way a human being could endure this. But this is, this is the testimony of a man who lived to tell his story. This is not, this is a biography much of it auto, because he told the first person who wrote it. It's crazy. But he continued, Zamperini continued to the end with resolve. Even, even after the, the war ended and he got back to regular life, for all of you veterans out there, I, I thank you for your service. And I know, not from firsthand experience, 
but I've, I've, I've studied enough to know that coming back to regular life is not easy. Regular life feels very non-regular at that point. But he came back and he struggled with another type of oppression. He self-medicated and became an alcoholic. Struggled through that, his family struggled. One day he found himself stumbling in to a Billy Graham crusade. And the Holy Spirit got a hold of him. And his life changed that day. And every experience that he had gone through, as miserable as it was, he started to contextualize in the story of God. And he helped many veterans work through their PTSD that they didn't even really know a whole lot about at that point. And so many people got saved through the testimony of a man who went through some terrible things. He even went back to Japan, met some of his guards that beat him, and forgave them. I don't know how people deal with that kind of thing, but I know in every story, there's pain and suffering. Where was God in that? If we just take the coffee mug scriptures, you start to believe that God is not keeping his promises. That he's not there. Or even, ooh, that maybe he's not always good. Let's keep going. Jeremiah 19, uh, excuse me, 29, 8 through 9, it says this. I'm sorry, 19, 8 through 9. Yep, good. For this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel says, don't let your prophets who are among you, mm, think about this, don't let your prophets who are among you and your diviners deceive you. And don't listen to the dreams you elicit from them. Know what this is? I'll keep reading. We'll figure it in a second. For they are prophesying falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them. This is the Lord's declaration. I'm just going to say right now, be very careful who you listen to. There are a lot of people out there who are going to misinterpret Scripture. Be careful about the prophets that you let into your life because many of them are not going to tell you the truth. Why is that? Because the truth, unfortunately, many times is not the popular message. There were prophets in this time telling the people, we're getting out of here. God is... On our side, the God of the armies, uh, God of armies is on our side. He's going to take down the, the, the Babylonians and we're going to be out of here in weeks, not years, not multiple. We're going to be out of here. God has spoken it. And God is going, they are lying. Settle in. Your suffering is going to be a while. And there's, an, there's another part to it, which is interesting. Author Catherine McNeil in her book, All, she, uh, All Shall Be Well, Awakening to God's Presence in His Messy, Abundant World. That's a long title. Writes about our love for life verses and the trouble we create for ourselves when we cling to a particular verse, applying it to ourselves out of context, such as placing it on a coffee mug or a ring. McNeil compares this to our relationship with social media where we see pictures of our friends' happiest moments, yet compare them to our mundane and messy daily lives, as if they don't have them. Let me ask you a question, those of you who are on social media. How many of you are taking dramatic and beautifully framed pictures of your messy kitchen? Of the breezeway? 
where all the coats are thrown and the backpacks are thrown. We all have that space in our house. Nobody takes pictures of that. We take pictures of our beautifulness right before we have a party. We had a Christmas party, staff Christmas party the other day. And Stephanie's like, does anybody live here? <laughs> yes, we clean up for the party. <laughs> right? Because we, we want to put our best foot forward when we have people over to our house. It doesn't always look that way. But we kind of get this, this, this contentment because obviously everybody else's lives are great. Promises in the Bible, like social media posts, need to be considered inside their full, messy context. She writes this. Somehow many of us believe that utmost success and ease are due us as our life verses seem to promise. So when the reality of life hits, it feels as though God has done something wrong. We're clutching to these hopeful Bible verses and browsing pages after page of friends, bright and cheerful social media posts, but we've never considered the context of any of them. God's faithfulness to Israel takes place over thousands of years of slavery, exile, and oppression. That requires a long, long surrender before the promise. God's redemption of creation is still pending completion. God's promise of creation is still pending completion. Now, let's get to Jeremiah 29, uh, 10, right before it. Ready? For this is what the Lord says. When 70 years for Babylon are complete, 70 years, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. When Jeremiah is referencing 70 years, he's basically saying, you will not see it. The ones who have gone into exile, I mean, 70 years, I mean, you're not going to see it. You're not going to see it. Your kids will see it, but you're not going to see it. Only in retrospect. Now think about this. That, that prophecy that we're about to go into, right? The, 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 the verse 29, 11 that we love. The prophecy that, to them, it was like, oh man. To us, it's so encouraging and strengthening. To them, it was like 70 years? It's only in retrospect after a few decades or centuries go by that we look at that particular verse with hope. For them, it was like, dang, 70 years? So let's, let's find out, let's read Jeremiah 29, 11, and then let's contextualize it with the after part, too. So we're going to go through 14. Here we go. And I, listen, I still wear this, I love this ring. Think about it. God has not, oh, we'll get it to later. Here we go. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know, so this is right after he says 70 years, right after he says, you're not going to see this. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for your disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Stop real quick. So what he's saying is that there's a future and a hope, but he's also going to prosper them in the midst of their struggle. For that, for that generation, he's, they're not going to come out of the struggle. They're never going to see their homeland again, ever. But I will be with you in the struggle, in the captivity, in the darkness, in the hard times, and then there will be a time. You will not see it, but there will be a time when I'm going to bring you out, your kids out, and there's going to be a future. That's my heart for you. Now, keep going here. It says this. You will call to me, let me just remind you that this is why they're in exile right now, because they forgot who God was. You will call to me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. But wait a minute, Pastor. What if my prayer is I want to get out of Babylon? Think about it for a second. He will listen to you. He's not a genie in a bottle. 
He's not your slave. He's your God. Just because you don't get the answer you want right, like, let me turn that around. Just because I don't get the answer that I want right here and right now doesn't diminish his Godship. He will listen. It doesn't mean he is tied to do what I tell him to do. That's a hard truth, guys. You will call to me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. This is the Lord's declaration. Suffering often leads us to God. You see, the reason you're in this, this, this situation right now is you've forgotten me. Can we say amen for America on that? You've forgotten me. Now, I'm not one of those people who, who um, believes America is the, the, the receiver of the modern-day promises of Israel. I don't, I don't believe that. I believe as long as we live by biblical principles, we'll be blessed by God, period. I don't think there's something special about America that's better than another country that God has to bless. I don't believe that. When we line up with the principles of God, we will be blessed by God. That's why non-believers, it's funny, non-believers who abide by the principles of God, they find themselves blessed by God. Isn't that crazy? I was reading, uh, my wife, I think I've shared this before, my wife was reading a book about finances. And it's a secular book, and they said, it's so crazy to us, we don't understand it. But people who give generally 10 to 12% of their income to charitable organizations have more money than those who don't. Go figure. I wonder where that principle comes from. Maybe the time we, try, maybe the time we spend trying to make our, the difficulties go, difficulties go away will be better spent in seeking the heart of God. How many times are your, is your prayer life distracted from the heart of God by trying to pray away your difficulties? If we know that he loves us, which we just talked about all this Christmas season, that he has good plans for us, if he wants to give us a future and a hope, maybe we should seek him. He says, you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. Here's a question for you, ready? A question I've asked myself this year. Are you more interested in what God can do for you than who God is. And now, I know, you have to strip away the Christianese, the cute church persona. And you would never say that. No, I'm only interested in what God can do for me. You would never, of course you wouldn't say that. But do we practically, in our lives, do we live that? I... I'm more interested in what God can do for me than God being God, who he is. Do we love him when things are great and blame him when things are bad? Is our love so fickle that we forget the goodness of God when life hits? Are we willing to place our hope in God when his view of our welfare and future may not look like comfort in this lifetime? Now, let me, let me, let me, let me just put some context. We're talking about context today. Let me put some context to that. They didn't get out of Babylon, but God said while they're in Babylon, he would be with them. What's that going to provide for them? He said, you, go have families. I'm going to give you kids. Go plant a garden. It's going to be a good garden. It's not going to be everything that you are hoping for, but in the middle, if you can seek after me, I'm going to show myself to you in the middle, in the midst of the suffering. I will be with you. And there are going to be things that are good because I am with you. There's going to be things that you're going to celebrate because I am with you. Do you know? 
that much of the modern tradition of the Jewish culture, the celebrations, the Passover Seder, were developed during this time of exile. The traditions that they carry down today are things that were developed based on the biblical history that they had, the Passover, the the, the symbolism that they give to all the things of their Passover feast um, was developed during their exile time. Hanukkah is the whole concept is that they they were under attack and God, I mean, all of these things were developed, these celebrations, these good things that came out, the, the, the culture that they developed were, were, were cooked in the, the pressure cooker of their suffering. I believe that I have in the past overlooked some of the blessings of God like a petulant child who didn't get everything they wanted at Christmas. I got 50 Great things, but I didn't get one thing that I wanted, so I'm going to throw a fit. I never did that as a child. My dad threw all my stuff out in the... In, no, excuse me. <laughs> you only get that if you hear on Sunday night. Uh, no, Friday night. I think it's important to remember that as people living in Babylon, we are not home yet. We're not home yet. We are literally people living in Babylon. We're not home yet. We are in exile. The Bible talks about this. The the ruler of Babylon is the Antichrist in in, in Revelations. The ruler of Babylon. Babylon represents the world. And all of its systems. A world that's ruled outside of the rule of God. Babylon encompasses all of that. It's it's used very heavily in Revelations. And the Antichrist is the ruler of that system. And we are not of that kingdom. We are pilgrims and strangers walking through this life. And it is not to its completion yet. In this life, we will have trouble, struggles. That's a promise of God that we don't often like to quote. But be of good cheer, because God has overcome this world, and the future and the hope is assured. We are aliens and strangers in a pagan world. The new Jerusalem is our future hope. But for now... We must thrive in this fallen world. So we build gardens. We build churches. We plant the kingdom of God everywhere we go. Like in the last series, we talked about the light shine. We shine the light of Christ wherever we go. But they will never accept us as one of their own because we're not. We're not. So don't be surprised. We live in a fallen world. And we are citizens now of the kingdom. I'm not saying that we shouldn't use the verses as a reminder of God's amazing goodness. He is. He's good. But as we claim God's goodness, let us also remind ourselves that God's good future And redemptive plans are still at work even when it seems like everything is upside down. That's a lesson I learned this year. By studying, by praying. And maybe we need to rethink a little bit what it looks like to thrive. And understand that God is not gone anywhere. It's just that we're not seeking him. We're seeking his outcomes. Well, I want the country to turn back to God. Wonderful. That's that's a great thing. Seek God. 
what does it profit you to get all frustrated that it's not that way? Seek God. And I'm, talk, I'm preaching to myself, folks, because this one's on me. I want, we've just, we've just had a couple run-ins with our, our kids' school systems. I want them to be a certain way. I, want, I don't want my kids to be indoctrinated a certain way. That's a great thing. Seek God. Seek God. Don't let your anxiety, frustration, anger well up so much that you are looking at the problem instead of at God. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all things will be added to you in his timing. So as we move into this new year, which is a new year, apparently COVID doesn't know it's going to be a new year because it was supposed to be over last year and it didn't get that memo. And now it's going to be the, supposed to be over this year. Guess what? Didn't get that memo. See what I'm saying? It doesn't know that it's a new year. But in this new year, how we mark time, let us, first off, be very careful who we are let into this. The voices that we let into here will affect how we read this. Be very careful. I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. I have to be careful. What, what uh, thoughts, thoughts are dangerous. Thoughts have power. Ideas. If they don't line up with this, chuck them. We're going to talk about that next week. First, be careful. If you're watching a lot of news or you're spending a lot of time on social media, I, I would just say be careful. Be discerning. I have personally, because of my personality, I'm a very much a uh, whole hog type of person. I just go all in. And if you ever see me eat, you know a whole hog person. I go all in. I have a hard time moderating a lot of things. So for me, I had to get off it completely because I couldn't moderate well. I had, to just, I had to cut it off. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're better at moderating than I am. But just be careful because your thoughts affect your emotions, and your emotions affect your look at the world. Again, I'm jumping into next week's sermon. Secondly, read this in context, please. There's nothing wrong with a life verse. Just make sure you know what the whole life verse means. Make sure you know the context of that life verse. It'll give it more weight than just what you think the coffee mug should say. And lastly, in a time when we're not home yet, it's more important to seek God, to, to draw close to him, than it is to get certain things to happen. And I want you to understand this very, very carefully from your pastor's mouth. God owes you nothing. He owed you nothing when he gave his son Jesus. He owed you nothing, yet he still sent Jesus. He owes you nothing, and he gives you everything. <laughs> so be careful. Be careful how you look at God. He's not a genie in a bottle. Seek after his heart and thrive. Thrive where he's put you. And let him work out the details of how, when and where and how he's going to get to resolve that issue. Lord, I thank you for lessons from your word and life. Lord, you know how I struggle with trying to divide the word of truth. I never want to say anything from this pulpit that is grandiose or sensational that is not part of your word. There's plenty of grandiose and plenty sensational if we just use the text as it's written. Lord, and anywhere that I've erred in that, I ask your forgiveness. 
Lord, I pray right now, Lord, that you would help us to understand that you are not absent in our suffering, that you're right in the middle of it, and you say, look at me, focus on me, I am here. God, help us to understand that we waste so much time getting to know you because we're looking at what you can provide instead of who you are. Teach us this year. As we move into this next year, God, I pray that whatever comes our way, I pray that there's amazing, amazing successes and reliefs and, and healings and joy from every, for everybody in here. But God, help us to understand that whether that's the season we're walking into or maybe it's more of the same or maybe it goes a little darker. You've never left us, left us and you will never forsake us. That you love us and you're here for us even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So Lord, I thank you for my brothers and my sisters. I thank you for them in a special way this year as many of them have walked through my grief with me. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would show yourself faithful in every, time, every part of our lives, good and bad. We love you today, God. We pray this all in the precious name of Jesus because without him, we couldn't even speak to you. A little heavier, I get that. Not as many jokes today. You've been laughing at my jokes in the last few weeks anyway, so I get to throw them out. I love you. I really do. Have a great week. God bless you.